Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Almighty God, we pray that you would be with us as you have sent your Son for us. Lord Jesus, abide with us. Remain with us, not just for the night. Be with us as you have promised, O Lord, into eternity, every day, the easy days and the hard days. Give us hearts that burn at your words of encouragement and forgiveness and mercy and grace. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have the bulletin, you see the picture that's there. If you don't have the bulletin, um, I did want to show you this picture. Cover my face with it. It's a picture of a long and winding alpine road that leads apparently up to a little chapel. St. Peter, in his reading, spoke to the Christians about uh, being exiles. And uh, in that whole letter, talks about their difficult journey. The um, picture on, that's demonstrated there made me think back, man, 25 years at least, to the time that a friend and I, when I lived in Columbia Falls, Montana, uh, took a trudge from Logan Pass into Granite Park Chalet and then back to the Loop. Uh, we didn't get up there until the afternoon and we had a 7 p.m. church council meeting uh, back at the church back in Columbia Falls so it was probably ill-advised and we were really short on time and the hike in from Logan Pass to Granite Park Chalet at the top of Glacier National Park um, was a relatively easy hike. I mean seven miles in but there's only 200 feet gain in the elevation. Then we went back as far as the loop, which was shorter, only four miles, and, and uh, we had one vehicle there, and um, that was not so much fun because it was a loss in elevation of 2,200 feet. And um, we were pressed for time, we had to get back, and as we're going back down, not on this scenic, nice, um, open expanse of relatively gentle trail, although there were some real steep um, drop-offs. We're winding down through the vegetation where there'd been a lot of bear activity, um, where we're losing 2,200 feet switchback after switchback. And it was like going down, I remember thinking, another switchback? More elevation loss? My, my knees can't take this. How much further? Surely we're almost there. And then we turn a corner and there'd be more of the same. At a certain point, I was exasperated. I was frustrated. I was downcast. I was weary. I was discouraged. How's your shelter at home exile going? It may have seemed like a reasonable thing to start with. It might even be fun. Work from home, a little more time to spend time with the kids, to spend time with my spouse, to spend time walking the dog, to spend time getting chores done around, some of those projects we've wanted to do, get those things done in the yard, spring cleaning, the garage cleaned out, and then maybe at a certain point, what? Again? Another week? We don't know how long? How much longer do I have to do this? Maybe you felt exasperated, frustrated, downcast, weary, discouraged. The two disciples going to Emmaus. It was a relatively short road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. The scripture says that they were sad-faced. It's a particular word that's used there for that. It's used only two times in the New Testament. It's not an uncommon word in classical Greek, but in the New Testament, only twice. Once, describing the impiety of some people, in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, where when they're fasting, they put on a sad face so everybody knows that they're miserable. And then here. In the secular usage, the word has a variety of ways that it's translated, and I think you'll get the sense of it. Um, 
one statesman is recorded by Plato to be heavy with thought so that he had a hard time engaging any conversation. Zeno writes about an embittered worker. He was made bitter because other workers did better than he and it reflected poorly on him. Or psychically depressed. Or Demosthenes says that the avaricious, the greedy, the misers, um, they put on a gloomy look so that nobody wants to meet their gaze and ask them for charity. Medea's evil eye, dark looks. Uh, Hippolytus described it as a person who brings bad news. One ancient historian describes a river as being sad-faced with this same word because it's there that he learned that his son had died. It just kind of a negative sense of discouragement all the way around. We know what it is to be discouraged when our world is uncertain. So let's consider this gospel lesson from Luke chapter 24. Now remember, it's on Easter Day. And the context of Easter is this, that Jesus has risen from the dead. And the appearances are that he appeared to Mary Magdalene. Then he appeared to the Marys. And there were other appearances. But the next thing that happens is Jesus appears to the Emmaus disciples as they're walking along. And Luke tells us that Cleopas and this other one are walking to Emmaus for the evening to spend the night, and they are talking about, what else? Talking about the only thing they could talk about, the last week, the triumphal entry, the casting out the money changers in the temple, Palm Sunday, the betrayal, the arrest, the crucifixion, the burial, and now apparently an empty tomb. Jesus joins them. They don't recognize him. And he asks them, what are you talking about? And it's a short sentence, but it's key. They stopped. They stopped in their tracks. And they were sad-faced. Their faces were downcast. And Cleopas says, stranger, you must be the only one in town that doesn't know everything that's just happened. And Jesus says, what? And he says, well, about Jesus, about Jesus of Nazareth, a powerful prophet in word and deed, and that he was handed over by our own people, our own leaders, to be beaten and scourged and crucified. And we had hoped that he was the one. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel to set things right. And of course the story gets crazier. This is the third day since that and some of our women came and said that the tomb was open and that they had seen a vision of angels that said that he was alive. And then it says that Jesus at that point said to them, oh, you're slow to believe. And starting with Moses and the prophets, the whole Old Testament, he explained how all this that had happened to Jesus of Nazareth was right on track. It's what God had planned to do, to redeem Israel, to pay the price for sin. And they get to Emmaus, and Jesus acts like he's going to keep going, and they say, no, as we just sang, abide with us. Fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with us, abide. So he stayed. They had the meal. And then we see in the meal the four verbs of the gospel accounts, the four verbs of Holy Communion, that he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke the bread, he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he was gone. And you see what they said? They said to each other, man, weren't our hearts burning? Or like Peter recorded on the day of Pentecost, the people were cut to the heart with the words about Jesus. Weren't our hearts burning when we heard him speaking? Even though we didn't see who it was, we heard him speaking about himself, about Jesus, about the redemption of Israel, 
about the promises of God having been kept. And they ran back to the other disciples, to the news that Peter had seen him. As we let these words speak to our own lives, consider with me two things. The first is this, that um, discouragement doesn't just belong on a mountain trail or sheltered in place or on the road to Emmaus. Discouragement is a problem for all of us, irrespective of who we are. We know what it is to have discouragement. Now, life can be a long, hard slog. You know, it can be an uphill trail, punctuated by places where everything goes downhill at a maddening pace, and we're in danger of losing control and going careening off of a corner. And we can get discouraged. And you know the discouragement in life, the scriptures tell us, is due to sin. It's due to your sin, my sin, the sin of other people. In the order of Matins, we didn't confess our sins, but when we do page five, we confess together that we are poor, miserable sinners. And that's not intended to be some kind of a groveling, self-deprecating statement. No, it's a statement of reality, namely this, that because I sin, there's misery in my life. My sin causes me misery, and if it weren't bad enough, my sin can cause you misery, and your sin can cause me misery, and there's the misery of sinfulness in the world around us. And we get discouraged, and we need the one who was promised to redeem. It's like Cleopas said, and we had hoped that Jesus of Nazareth would be the one to redeem Israel. The word redeem there is used also in 1 Peter, where it describes paying the ransom, paying the price, paying the cost for sin and its consequences. It can be hard to see our need sometimes because of our discouragement, because discouragement is there for all of us. But secondly, this is the message of Easter. The message of Easter is not a message of discouragement, it's a message of encouragement. It's a message of the reality that Jesus is living. That Jesus is the one who redeems Israel. This is how Peter said it in that letter. He said that he has redeemed us not with perishable things such as silver or gold, it was not silver or gold by which you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. That was the words of encouragement from Peter. The reality that Jesus is alive is encouragement, not just because he's the one who redeems Israel, but he is present in the sacrament. Make no mistake, Luke 24, Luke the Gospel writer, wants us to see Jesus present in the Last Supper, in the Holy Communion. The language is all the same from earlier in his Gospel, when Jesus was in the upper room with them. And it is in that act that the presence of Jesus is known, and their eyes were opened, and they saw him. In Holy Communion, the Lord's Table, the Eucharist, the Holy Supper, whatever terms you want to use, the Table of the Lord, Jesus is present. Now, we at St. Peter's are currently unable to celebrate that. Because, as Jesus said, when you come together, well, right now we can't come together. When this is all lifted, we will, with joy, to receive his presence for the forgiveness of sins for encouragement, for the strengthening of our faith. But I want to encourage you in something else. It is sad for me that we're not able to come to Holy Communion, but you'll notice what the Emmaus disciples said. They saw him when he broke the bread, but when did their hearts burn? Were not our hearts burning on the way when we heard 
the word of the scriptures by which he explained himself. Until we're together again, we rejoice and find comfort in the words which make our hearts burn, or on the day of Pentecost, that cut the people to the heart where they wanted to know the Redeemer. We rejoice that God works surely through his word in holy baptism. In my baptism, in your baptism, the Spirit of God worked according to his word of promise. And that word of promise is still operative in your life. We rejoice in his word, which makes our hearts burn in the family altar. But what I mean by family altar is when the family gathers together to pray, to hear the scriptures, maybe to sing a hymn, to recite the catechism. Every family does it a little differently. But it is the word that we gather around. It's the word we're gathered around right now, virtually. We can't be with one another, but we rejoice to hear the word proclaimed together. So this text displays the Emmaus disciples with discouragement. You've known discouragement. I know you have because I have too. We're all alike. Maybe the discouragement of a long, hard path that doesn't seem like it's ever going to end. A wearisome shelter in place. A hard day in a world that you're in exile in. It's not your home. Heaven's your home. Living the life of faith, even with joy, although tempered with discouragement over sin, our own sin and others. I am here to tell you the message of Easter, which is the message of encouragement. That this one, Jesus of Nazareth, whom Cleopas and the other had hoped would be the Redeemer of Israel, is the Redeemer of Israel. He is the risen Savior. He is the living Redeemer, the one that paid the price, not gold or silver, but his own suffering and life. He's the one who was crucified, buried, and risen, and present to redeem you. Say the words of the Easter greeting with me. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.